Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about another theory that tries to explain the potential origin of the mysterious dark matter. Where did it come from, and what exactly is it made out of? And in this case, we're going to be focusing on this very theoretical concept that proposes that the dark matter might actually, after all, be made out of tiny black holes. Although in this case, the scientists behind the paper you can find in the description propose a relatively complex explanation involving a lot and a lot of particle physics and a lot of ideas from the changes in the early universe. But I figured uh, it's still a pretty cool explanation, still a pretty good idea, pretty solid idea, and it's definitely something that I could try to explain in this video. And so the title of this paper is Primordial Black Holes from a Cosmic Phase Transition, the Collapse of Fermi Balls. And it tries to explain the mysterious dark matter as what's known as primordial black holes, black holes that existed since the beginning of the universe. Now first, quick side note, we still obviously have no idea what dark matter really is. We obviously see the effects of the mysterious dark matter, such as the expected versus observed rotation curves of various galaxies along with some unexpected lensing effects from the invisible mass in the middle of different clusters that shouldn't really be there, with a lot of other observations we've discussed in some of the previous videos. But the problem here is that, well, for the past few decades, despite many different experiments, no particle has been discovered to try to explain all of this. For example, one of the most common theories uses what's known as WIMPs, weakly interactive massive particles, and this is supposed to be the explanation for how dark matter works, with the other common explanation being another particle known as axion. But though theoretically they do make sense, none of the experiments so far have found anything. No WIMPs or axions have been found, despite many many different attempts to find them. And naturally, because of this, there are several alternative explanations to dark matter. The most popular, or I guess the most famous one, is known as MOND. But they don't explain everything, as a matter of fact, some things they cannot explain at all. And because of this, not everyone, or actually most scientists, do not accept them. The dark matter still is believed to be some sort of a particle. Or maybe a tiny black hole. As a matter of fact, Stephen Hawking himself always believed that it was primordial black holes. Now, there's a video from a couple of years ago where the Japanese scientists tried to investigate this idea. And they did so in a very clever way. They wanted to see if there are really these primordial black holes, or at least some sorts of black holes, traveling across the Andromeda galaxy. And so they looked at the Andromeda galaxy for a long period of time, and they tried to discover any kind of signs of these primordial black holes by looking at the gravitational lensing effects of various invisible dense objects moving in front of different stars. Now, they've only found one, even though they expected thousands, and this implied to them that there were no massive black holes, or at least black holes in the range of the mass of our Sun, or possibly a few masses of Jupiter, traveling in the Andromeda galaxy. Which also implied that the larger black holes could not explain dark matter. And normal black holes, the so-called stellar black holes, definitely cannot explain anything. You would have to have a lot of them everywhere, and we'll be able to see them in many different surveys we've already conducted. As a matter of fact, just in terms of the numbers of the stars in the galaxy, there are just not enough stars to produce all of these black holes. Nevertheless, primordial black holes could be entirely different. They would not be produced in the same way. They could be produced in an entirely different way, and they could also be a lot less massive and thus invisible, or at least somewhat invisible. And because of this, in that paper from the Japanese scientists, they also established that if there are primordial black holes, they have to be less than a mass of the moon or so, or possibly a mass of several asteroids. But I guess the question is, well, how would they be produced and what exactly could create such black holes? Well, there have been many propositions, but the one in this particular paper is particularly intriguing. And the explanation here involves what happened in the universe in the first moments after the Big Bang started. Essentially, the universe before a lot of particles became particles, before the fundamental forces solidified and became the forces we know today, and essentially when things were extremely different, the universe was extremely, extremely hot, and everything was extremely dense, extremely hot, and somewhat difficult to imagine. But we know that this probably existed in the first few moments, simply based on the observations from the CMB, the Cosmic Microwave Background. 
And during that time, there were a lot of different transitions and changes of state, as it's known. Essentially, as the universe cooled down, things changed into other things. And these changes of state can be sort of compared to how liquid water turns into ice, or how liquid water turns into gas. But in this case, today the physicists believe that the entire universe can be described in terms of different scalar fields. Fields of energy, fields of forces, and in each of those fields, various particles are produced through the breaking of symmetry. So essentially, in order to get a photon, or in order to get any particle, you would have to have certain field suddenly have some sort of a breaking of symmetry in order for the particle to be formed. Now, in this case, the scientists also are pretty certain that these fields transformed in their state, especially when the universe started to cool down. And during that transformation, it's very likely that some of the particles that used to be present in these fields might have also been somehow affected. And so this so-called phase transition is essentially what forms the idea behind this paper. They believe that the phase transition might have resulted in the formation of these primordial black holes. Here's how they kind of explain this. And so let's use an analogy here. The scalar field is going to be liquid water, or just a notion in a sense. And in this case, our ocean is going to have its own particles that would not exist in modern universe. We're going to think of these particles as the tiny, tiny crystals of salt that are present everywhere in every ocean on the planet. And so we have the liquid ocean and we have the salt. Now normally on Earth, as the temperature increases, water turns into gas. But in this case, we're actually cooling down the universe, so it's slightly different. Anyway, as the universe was cooling down, a lot of these fields started to transition their state. They started to experience phase transition. And so in this case, the liquid water is going to be turning into gas. It's going to start evaporating. But just like with the water, it doesn't just suddenly happen everywhere. When you boil water, it doesn't just entirely evaporate right away. It starts with tiny bubbles, and these bubbles start to kind of spread slowly, moving from one place to another, eventually combining, growing in size, and turning liquid water into water gas. But in our ocean water, what happens to the salt? The salt particles will actually start accumulating and creating tiny crystals. At least that's what happens if you try to evaporate salt water. And these crystals sometimes grow in size and become bigger and bigger. And once all of the water is gone, you get something like this. And so something similar might have happened according to the scientists in this paper. They believe that in the early universe there were these unusual particles probably some sort of a fermion particles, fermions referring to particles that don't really like to be in the same place and tend to repel each other. So for example, electrons, protons, neutrons, they're all fermions. And as the scalar fields in our early universe started to transition, the early fermions very likely could not transition with them. They most likely just started to kind of clump together and create bigger and bigger lumps with everything around them slowly transitioning into the state where they could not exist. So something similar actually does happen in salt water when you start evaporating it and when the salt starts to deposit on the bottom. And as the scalar field started to transition, the leftover fermions started to form what the scientists refer to as Fermi balls. And this is an actual concept that was proposed back in 1994 that some scientists do believe might exist in certain conditions. So in this case, a Fermi ball is a collection of fermions that should really not be together because of their repulsion force but in some cases, through what's known as the Yukawa interaction, they can actually collect into larger pieces. The pieces would be the Fermi balls. And as these Fermi balls grow larger and larger, at some point they can reach a threshold where they basically collapse, simply because they could no longer support themselves. That's literally how black holes form as well. And as a result, from these Fermi balls, we get these primordial black holes. And that's sort of how the origin of these black holes is explained in the paper. They also provide a somewhat basic illustration showing us how all of this works. So as these bubbles grow larger and larger, they kind of start to separate a lot of these fermions into the only areas where they can still exist. And eventually, as the universe starts to transition through its phase, we're left with these regions that they refer to as Fermi balls with quite a lot of mass on the inside, which then end up collapsing, producing primordial black holes with black holes being able to exist in that transition phase of the scalar field. And so essentially, in their theory, the formation of the primordial black holes depends on two principles. First is the transition of the scalar field in the early universe, something that we know existed for sure. But the second part here is a little bit more hypothetical. Here the expectation is that something else existed in the early universe, 
some other types of fermions that do not exist today, and that something then started to bunch into Fermi balls, which then collapsed into black holes. Now, the only way for us to ever try to prove any of this is to maybe somehow try to recreate this early universe in the lab. But the thing is, that would be pretty difficult, almost impossible. This would require uh, way, way more energy than we can actually produce right now. And so for now, this is just a theoretical explanation. The only other way to try to prove this is to maybe find one of these primordial black holes. So in this case, the scientists do actually make a speculation about the mass and potential size of these black holes. Their calculations suggest that the mass of a typical primordial black hole could be about 10 to the power of 14 kilograms. Equivalent to the total mass of carbon fixed by photosynthesis on Earth every single year. Or approximately 10 times the mass of the famous 67P chirumov gerasimenko comet. Which would be equivalent to a mass of an asteroid that's approximately 3 kilometers in diameter. But I guess the question is, well, can these black holes exist? Remember, black holes also evaporate. That's of course based on the Stephen Hawking's prediction of what we refer to as the Hawking radiation. And the black holes that are not very massive are going to disappear pretty quickly. And so I guess the question is, how long can a black hole of this mass exist in the universe? And there's actually a really easy way to calculate this. There are a lot of different calculators online, but I found this one by Victor Toth to be one of the most accurate ones. And here, if you enter the mass of the black hole, it tells you pretty much everything about it, including the potential lifetime. And so if we enter the mass that's proposed in the paper, we'll discover that this particular black hole can actually survive for a pretty long time. That's approximately 100 million times longer than the current age of the universe. And so these black holes are going to be around for a long, long time, assuming they exist. Now, can we find out if they exist? That's the other question. Currently, there's really no way for us to determine if they are real and if they actually are out there. But some of the future telescopes will definitely allow us to study what's known as the microlensing effects. In this case, extremely fast microlensing effects. The effects produced by these very, very small bodies, extremely dense bodies, passing in front of distant stars. And if by some chance we start detecting a lot of these microlensing effects all over the place, especially from objects that seem to be asteroids but are not really visible in any other way, in that particular case, there might be a chance to discover some of these primordial black holes. Although at the moment, it's still really far to tell if we'll ever be able to find them. But since they represent approximately 80% of all of the mass in the universe, well, they should be pretty much everywhere around us, and we should be able to find them possibly even in our own solar system. And so in that sense, this is actually something really exciting. If one day we start discovering unusual emissions of different X-rays and possibly even gamma rays coming from some sort of a not-so-distant object in the solar system, in that case, that would definitely be some sort of a primordial black hole. But since it would be extremely small in size, chances are this particular black hole would not really be producing that much radiation and would still be somewhat invisible. These objects would be a thousand or several thousand times smaller than a typical virus. And that means that it would still be extremely challenging to find them and to actually prove their existence. Nevertheless, it's still an interesting theory, an interesting proposition, and a theory that's been proposed many, many times with different explanations before. So it's not something that scientists do not think exists. As a matter of fact, primordial black holes are an explanation for a lot of different phenomena, including supermassive black holes. And so their existence is almost certain. But how small they get and also their numbers is, of course, a completely different question. Something that we cannot currently answer. Anyway, on that note, well, that's all I wanted to mention. Check out the paper in the description below, all of the other relevant links there as well. Subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership or by buying the wonderful Prussian t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.